When I was in junior high school, I had a tormentor. I don't remember his name, but I remember his voice. It was loud. He was loud. And he would be loud in public settings, like in a classroom, in the hallway, in the lunchroom, in the change room. And for some reason, he chose to pick on me. Maybe it was because I showed fear when I first met him and he was loud. And after that, whenever he saw me, he would target me. Anders, what are you doing? Anders, what's with your face? And to add to my troubles, I was in the school band, which was a very uncool group to be part of in our school at that time. And to make matters worse, our band teacher decided it would be cool to get new band uniforms. And the band uniforms he ordered were polyester, dark purple, with these lame yellow sashes across the front. And on top of that, the pants that were assigned to me were way too high, like I had flood pants. So imagine me walking around in that band suit. The entire school made fun of our, our band uniforms. They called them monkey suits for some reason. Well, when my tormentor saw me in my band suit, he went crazy. And he let the whole world know that Anders was walking by in his monkey suit. How humiliating. I was mad. I was fearful, but I wanted the worst to happen to this guy. But he was way bigger than me. So I tried to avoid him as much as possible, and slowly, I think, but surely I began to learn ways and have courage to stand up to him a little bit. And then junior high ended, and we went to high school, and it was a much larger school, and our paths seldom crossed again. Yet those times were hard. And as I look back on it, I guess I experienced a type of oppression. And oppression is prolonged, cruel, or unjust treatment or control. And we can experience oppression in all kinds of ways and in places. Some of you have experienced it from a corrupt government official. Some of you lived through a time when those in power targeted your people group. Or we can be oppressed at home. A parent oppresses their child with cruelty or preventing them from opportunities or freedom. Siblings can be cruel to a younger sibling or a different sibling. Husbands can be abusive and controlling towards their wives. Wives can oppress their husbands with, with cruel words, never-ending cruel world, words. Adult children can oppress their aging parents by demanding money from them or treating them poorly while they suffer or require care. A coach can oppress a team member that they don't like. A teacher can oppress a student they don't like, and students can gang up on teachers that they don't like. Landlords or tenants can oppress or persecute the other. It seems like life in a fallen world like ours includes oppression. So how do we respond when we're mistreated or oppressed? And if you think back to times in your life where this may have happened, how did you respond and was the response helpful? Did it lead to something positive, some sort of resolution, some sort of help for you? Perhaps even more important is the question, how does God respond to oppressors? There are many situations where people are powerless in the face of oppression. Does God care? Will God do something? And that's what we're going to explore today in the next section on, in James's letter. He's going to address a group of people who held great power in their society, yet they misused it and abused it at the expense of others. 
and James will expose what they did, and then he will tell what God will do in response. And finally, we're going to examine how we can respond in a God-glorifying way when we experience oppression. So I invite you to find in your Bibles today, James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. It's on page 857 in the Bibles that we have for you there, in, if you're here with us today. And I'm just reading the verse, first six verses of chapter 5. This is not a passage that you would put on your wall for encouragement. This is one of those harsh passages, but remember James is addressing oppressors. So James 5, verses 1 to 6. Come now, you wretch. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Well, James is addressing a troubling situation that many lived under in that day. Back in the first century, there was no such thing as a middle class. There was a few people who were very, very rich, and everyone else lived in virtual poverty trying to survive. One historian writes this, first century Israel before the year 70 witnessed an increasing concentration of land in the hands of a small group of very wealthy landowners. And as a result, the small holdings of many farmers got absorbed into these large estates. These farmers were then forced to earn their living by hiring themselves out to their rich landlords. So imagine that you have worked to eke out a living on your little plot of land and then a drought strikes and you have no means to provide for your family, so you have to sell your land to a wealthy land owner and you become the hired person to work the land that you once owned. But now the profits go to the land owner and he cheats you out of fair wages and that's the situation that James addresses. He speaks to these rich landowners, yet it's very unlikely that they would actually read this passage because most likely they're unbelievers, for he offers them no call to repentance. So why would James write a passage to wealthy landowners who would likely never read it? It must be because he is trying to speak to the people who would read it by addressing these wealthy oppressors. He's got a message to communicate the, to those who are being oppressed. And it starts in verse 1, which sets the tone where he says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. This is Old Testament prophetic language. The prophets confronted those who mistreated the vulnerable. And James calls them to howl and weep because a terrible future awaits them, which would surprise almost everyone in that culture. For many believed that wealth indicated God's blessing. And on top of that, the rich would often have means to insulate themselves from the miseries of life. They could pay for that private jet to get them out of a disaster zone. They can hire security guards to protect themselves from robbers. They have various stashes of wealth to save for a rainy day, but James pronounces with certainty that misery is on the way. And the author of these miseries 
will be none other than the Lord himself. So, what were they doing? What charges does James bring against the rich? Well, the first one is they fraudulently kept back wages from their laborers. Verse 4, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. So in those days, it was common practice to pay the laborer at the end of the day because the laborer needed the money to feed his family. So somehow these landowners were withholding these wages by fraud. Maybe they said, oh, I don't have any cash today, so I won't be able to pay you. And the poor laborer goes home to tell his wife, there's no money tonight. We're not going to be having anything to eat. And notice, who does the crying out in the first, four verse, or in the first part of verse 4? It's not the laborer. It's the wages. The wages are crying out. So James is portraying that simply by mentioning the wages, how much they were, they would be obviously unfair obviously unjust if some farmer shared with another one this is how much my landowner is paying me the person hearing it would say that's completely unjust but then in the second half of verse 4 it is the harvesters who cry out and notice who the harvesters cry out to the lord of hosts the lord of of angel armies. This is an image of the Lord being roused to action because of the cry of these, ar- of these harvesters. And the Lord is a Lord of angel armies. So, recompense, payment is coming. But holding back low wages is not the only charge brought against the rich. The second charge brings it, James brings against them is they use excess wealth to live in luxury and self-indulgence. So they used their excess wealth to live in luxury and self-indulgence rather than helping the poor. Verse 5, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. So like cattle standing in a field full of grain or, or grass would just gorge themselves on it if they weren't controlled, these rich gorge themselves on luxuries. They live for their own personal pleasure no matter the cost. And the self-indulgence comes at the expense of the poor or the vulnerable. The rich use their wealth to fund a luxurious life instead of saving lives. And a luxury is by definition something not needed for survival. It is something in excess. And James charges those who live like this with selfish indulgence that neglects the needs of others. And then the third charge that James levels at them is they condemned and murdered the righteous man. In verse 6, he says, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Now, James may refer to actual murder here, but more likely he is pointing to the impact of such a lifestyle on others. A rich person who fails to pay fair wages may cause their laborers to starve. Or he may take them to court. For the word condemn in verse 6 is a legal term. And maybe the rich person took those unable to pay their debts to the judge. And we would expect, well, that's going to be justice. Except most of the judges were landowners. They were in league with the landowners. And the righteous person does not resist, maybe because he has no means to face the judge. Maybe he has no energy to put up a fight, so the rich person just bowls him over. 
So these are the three charges. One, you withhold low wages by fraud. Two, you live excessively and in luxury at the expense of others. Three, your decisions can lead to the death of your workers. And these three charges will result in a response from God. So how will God respond? Well, his response will not be an emotional outburst or an overreaction. His response will be based on evidence. Evidence. Notice in verses 2 and 3, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you. Well, rotting riches means they serve no purpose. They were left stowed away somewhere and never spent. Clothes eaten by moths are wasted. So the rich had many beautiful cloaks and dresses, but they had so many of them that they didn't use them frequently, and moths got in to destroy them. And then there's the verse about the corrosion or rusting of gold or silver, and technically, precious metals cannot rust or corrode. But they can lose their shine, and maybe James is saying that even the most precious metal in the world, gold, can be corrupted by hoarding it. One commentator puts it like this, these people have retained so much unused wealth that even the untarnishable, like gold, has become tarnished in God's eyes. And God will look at all this evidence and he sees the unused riches stowed away and he sees the moth-eaten garments And he sees the tarnishing of the gold and silver. And he will respond by bringing a just vengeance against rich oppressors. Vengeance can be defined as punishment inflicted or retribution exacted for an injury or a wrong committed. It is a form of payback for wrongdoing. It requires payment for an injustice committed and this payment might take the form of time spent in prison or some sort of suffering that corresponds to the crime the lord will bring fair and full justice upon those who oppress others and this will happen sometimes in this life but certainly on the day of the lord or judgment day and there are multiple images of judgment day or day of the lord throughout this passage we've already noted miseries in verse one and then notice in verse three that phrase flesh like fire their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire fire is an image of judgment day and it will apply to individuals it's not just a concept individuals will be judged as their flesh as flesh and at the end of verse 3 he even uses the phrase last days you have laid up treasure in the last days but that treasure might be simply that you've laid up the wrong kind of treasure for last days or you've laid up all kinds of evidence for the last days that you will deserve this judgment And then notice the end of verse 5, which says, you have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. So you know the image of fattening the cow before butchering it for the feast. The image here is of fattening the heart, making oneself ripe for judgment by constant injustice and oppression of others. So God will bring a just vengeance against oppressors. And the question I have for you is how do you feel about that? How do you respond to the claim God will bring judgment upon those who oppress the vulnerable? And for some of us, it's good news. Oh, finally that person that oppressed us, that person that did great harm to our family and got away with it, 
will face justice. So it's good news. And this passage is one of the many throughout the Bible that speaks of God's justice and judgment. But some of us might be troubled by a God who brings vengeance, especially when it's applied to real people, maybe people we know. So why might we struggle with a God who brings justice and a God who brings a just vengeance? Well, here's some possibilities. One reason we might struggle is we humans seldom agree on what's just. Someone gets sentenced for a crime and everyone has an opinion. Oh, that was too light. Oh, that was too much. And we might project our uncertainty about justice onto God and think, you know, we can't agree on justice, so God probably can't do it either. That might be one reason. Or we might struggle with God's vengeance because we can't reconcile it with God's grace. Isn't a God of vengeance the God of the Old Testament? Except we're in the New Testament. God is gracious and he is just. We might think that since God is gracious, it's unfair for God to judge. He should show everyone grace. Except Hitler. Except Stalin. And then we add more and more names to that list because they don't deserve grace. And neither do we. But we somehow think that people today should all receive grace or God's unfair. But God is perfectly just. God is by his very nature just. Yet he made a way to justly pay for our sin through Christ. He didn't sweep it under the carpet. Jesus paid for it with his blood. But if people reject that offer of grace, then God will justly respond. Yet he graciously gives people years of life to turn away from their oppressive ways and receive his grace. Yet one day God's patience and grace will run out. Whether it be on the day we die or the day of the Lord when Christ returns. So why might we struggle with God's judgment? Reason number three, we may think it's wrong to judge since Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. But that verse is talking about interpersonal relationships where you look down on a person to feel superior to them. It's being judgmental, thinking oneself superior and looking down at another. But we're still called to discern and call one another to account, especially within the church. And Jesus is not declaring, well, we're not going to do judgment anymore. No, don't be judgmental but you're still called to discern. Or we might struggle with this because we don't want to be judged. And so we think, you know, if we minimize God's judgment or we deny that it's going to happen, uh, maybe we'll be protected. Maybe it won't happen to us. But if you're a Christian here, you don't have to worry about judgment. The verdict has already been pronounced, not guilty based on faith in Christ and what he has done. So we can trust that God will call all things to account justly for oppressors. And then a fifth reason we might struggle with God's just vengeance is because we've never experienced serious oppression in our lives. We can't comprehend this oppression being really that bad. But Think about how this passage would speak to one of James' readers. They've had their land basically stolen by a wealthy landowner. And the poor person slaves away on that which used to be their land for unfair wages. And they see their family slowly withering away because of lack of food. And they occasionally get a glimpse of the wealthy landowner in their carriage or wagon as they're, as they're pulled out of their estate. And inside is the landowner and his family, and they're all laughing and having a great time on their way to an extravagant party. And the carriage passes this farmer whose children are starving, and the wealthy landowner pays him no mind and has no concern for the farmer's starving children. 
And the farmer looks up to heaven and says, God, what is this? What's going on? And then comes to the gathering of Christians and this letter is read and this passage is read. And they hear that God is roused to action against oppressors. They hear that God will bring down those who treated them so ruthlessly. They're filled with hope because they're not abandoned. Someday the wrongs will be made right. They will experience a restoration of some sort, if not in this life, certainly in the next. And if we can't identify with the oppressed, Maybe we're too insulated or unaware of the realities others face around us. Maybe we're too focused on luxury items or too immersed in indulging ourselves. We need to repent of that and ask for Jesus' eyes to see those around us. And maybe we need to evaluate if we've practiced hoarding in any way. Do we have unused clothes in our closets? Do we have riches stashed away with no intention to use? We just want to keep them for ourselves? Do we have much more wealth than we need, yet we just hoard it to ensure we're okay while others starve? Jesus said the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and he also said how difficult it is for the rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that countercultural? what Jesus said? We look at the rich, the super rich, and say, oh, they've got it made. And Jesus says, this is a major hindrance to entering the kingdom of heaven. So we need to ask the Spirit to evaluate our hearts for any of these tendencies. And then we need to depend on Christ to respond in a godly way when we have been mistreated or oppressed. And there's three things I want to give you as we close today. How must Christ followers respond when mistreated and oppressed? Number one, we must leave vengeance to the Lord. Romans 12, 19 says, Behold, be be beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So if we're oppressed or wronged, we don't take vengeance because it will backfire. Remember Cain, who took vengeance against his brother, and the vengeance mastered his life and destroyed it in Genesis 4. So leave vengeance to the Lord. Secondly, seek justice. It's not wrong to seek justice. Micah 6, 8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice. And throughout Scripture, God exhorts his people to practice justice. He confronts and condemns Israel for neglecting justice towards the vulnerable. It is right for us to seek justice, not vengeance. But we must also be prepared for an imperfect justice this side of eternity. And then thirdly, find peace to persevere in Christ. Find peace to persevere under oppression in Christ. And I'm going to read 1 Peter 2.19 and then verses 21 to 23. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. And then this is about Jesus. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And so in following Christ's example, we persevere, but we entrust our oppressor to the Lord who judges justly. And Jesus suffered the worst oppression in all of history, yet through it, God saved and continues to save many. So we entrust our oppressors to the Lord and seek his strength to persevere patiently. 
like Christ did. So when oppressed, leave vengeance to the Lord while seeking justice and peace in him. And as we pray today, I want to speak to those of you who have been oppressed in your life, maybe for a long time, by someone or something or some situation. And I'm going to pray that God will come especially close to you so that you sense his love, his concern, and his eye upon you and what you have gone through. And some of us need to honestly evaluate if we have adopted any of these attitudes of the rich, self-indulgent living, living in excess, pursuing more and more that we don't need. We repent of that. And then we act in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Some of you need strength to pursue justice in a situation that you're facing. And some of you need strength to persevere amidst the oppression that you're suffering. And so I'm going to pray for all of those today, but I want to give you a moment just to respond to the Lord in prayer to anything that he's been speaking to you about. So let's, let's pray together, and in a moment I'll lead us. Lord Jesus, life in this world seems to include oppression. We humans, if we follow our natural selves, our sinful nature, just try to grind others down, beat others down, feel better about ourselves by putting others down. Many here have been on the receiving end of that, Lord. And I pray for them, whether they've been oppressed at home or at work or at school or in some other situation, Lord, be especially close to them right now and impress upon them that you have seen every moment and every incident of oppression against them and that you care about it and that you will call it to account. And others of us are in the process of pursuing justice for some wrong that has been committed. Grant strength to pursue justice while not taking vengeance, both in process and in words. We can so easily cut and destroy our oppressor in words. And some of us may need to repent today, Lord, because we've slid into in this rich, luxurious lifestyle. Empower us to not only hear this word, but to act upon it. And for those today who are facing a situation where it's going to be either going back to work, where there's an oppressor there, maybe going back to school, going back to a class, facing a family member, whatever it is, Lord, we need your grace and your strength to persevere to suffer unjustly while entrusting our oppressor to the one who judges justly so help us lord help us to live to suffer as you suffered and thank you for caring for us deeply we pray all this in the name of our strong and mighty Lord of hosts.